We're only on this earth for a short while. But if we're lucky, we may find a soulmate who fills our days with joy and affection. Being in love is like being on drugs. There's this feeling about one more and more and more. But falling in love can also be a wild ride. And if you take a wrong turn, you could wind up lost. So many young girls get tied in with certain dudes who aren't good for them, and they just keep going. She is just so blinded by the fact that she would do anything for her man. It gets to the point where, you know, they have to make a decision in their life. When push comes to shove, who will you choose? Yourself or your man? She's putting her trust in him. She's pouring her heart out to him. Some men are able to see that someone is missing something and take advantage. She had a lot of opportunities not to go down that road and never stopped. No amount of being in love is worth your life. March 24th, 2016, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A city once known as the heart of America's steel industry, Pittsburgh has reinvented itself for the 21st century. Pittsburgh was on the decline for a really long time, but it's come back to life. It's a great city. It's a city made up of a bunch of different neighborhoods, so it's a bunch of little cities in one. But not every corner of the Steel City has kept pace with its revitalization efforts. Pittsburgh is a very diverse city where there are areas that are extremely beautiful and safe and quiet, and then there are some neighborhoods that are extremely dangerous and violent. One of Pittsburgh's seedier areas is a neighborhood known as Beltsuver, located on the shores of the Monongahela River. Bellsuver is a pretty violent area. There's a lot of drug activity, street gangs. So when a flurry of 911 calls come in that afternoon, reporting gunshots in the Bellsuver area, Pittsburgh police are ready for anything. And when the uh, patrol officers arrived, they met with a, a witness on scene who essentially pointed them in the direction of the shots fired. This particular location, it was a wooded area. It was relatively secluded. As police make their way inside the brush, they come upon an unsettling scene. They found a young man lying face down in a pool of blood. The man doesn't respond when officers call out to him, and it quickly becomes clear why. He's been shot more than a dozen times. He was shot in the torso and in the face. There was a lot of blood. Medics came to render first aid, but it was obviously too late. He was deceased. At first glance, there's no indication of who the dead man is. He didn't have ID. He didn't have a cell phone. So initially, we didn't have much to go on. But police get a hit when they run the victim's fingerprints through their database. He's identified as 21-year-old Savion Scott Ponder. To those that knew him, Savion Scott Ponder was hardworking, kind, and creative. He was a college student at Indiana University, Pennsylvania. It's a local school outside the Pittsburgh area. There, Savion pursued his lifelong dream of becoming a fashion designer. We had a clothing company. He was always into clothes and to design, and that's what he wanted to do with his life. He had a bright future ahead of him. He was in college. He was trying to make ends meet. He was doing the hustle, but he was also doing the studying. And in November of 2015, Savion got some life-changing news. He was about to become a father. He had a girlfriend. They were a pretty new thing. This wasn't something they had planned, but he really stepped up to the plate. He got an apartment with his girlfriend and another good friend. He was going to school. He was trying to build a life for himself and for his family. But now, Savion has been found brutally shot to death in a wooded area on the seedy south side of Pittsburgh.
end as investigators search the crime scene for clues. They keep coming up empty-handed. There was little evidence to go on. We recovered seven casings. But other than that, there wasn't a ton of physical evidence to help us. The crime scene wasn't extraordinarily elaborate, but what's very interesting was the fact that he didn't have shoes on. It's a small detail that strikes the detectives as potentially significant. There was no real reason why the shoes were off. There's nothing that showed that there were any gunshot wounds by his legs or his feet to that extent. Possibly there were a pair of expensive shoes that were taken. We thought robbery was a possibility. People like shoes, it's kind of a commodity. Had Savion been killed in a robbery gone wrong? Or is there another explanation for his violent death? Investigators hope that their eyewitness holds the answer. Well, we started with the original 911 caller, who was a resident of the area. They saw the vehicle drive down, which was very strange, because it's not a very high-trafficked area. Even more strange, this witness then says that she saw two men dragging another man into the woods. A few moments later, she heard a barrage of gunshots coming from the woods. She told police it sounded like someone emptied their gun. If it's not a firing range, there's no reason to hear one gunshot, let alone multiple, 10 plus. Once the shooting stopped, the witness says only two of the men emerged from the woods and fled in a gray car. So you have basically someone driving a car to a desolate location, three individuals, one being led into a field, and then only two coming back. It's pretty clear at this point this isn't a robbery. It sounds more like a cold-blooded murder. If you're just there to steal someone's shoes, you're not going to shoot them a dozen more times. This was just straight execution. Then the question becomes, why was Savion the target of such an execution? March 24th, 2016. After responding to a string of urgent 911 calls, Pittsburgh police have found 21-year-old college student Savion Scott Ponder shot to death in a wooded area on the south side of town. This bunny officer saw a large amount of blood and the victim had no shoes on. It appeared to the officers that he had been shot multiple times. At first, investigators thought they could be dealing with a robbery. But now, an eyewitness account has led them to consider another possibility. It sounds like an execution-style murder. There wasn't anything to indicate at that time that it had anything to do with the robbery. Along with the witness's account, the sheer violence of the crime points to a more personal motive. To shoot someone over a dozen times, you have to have a real vendetta against him. It showed that the person was either very angry or wanted to make sure that the victim was dead or to send some sort of message. My partners and I worked through the evening to work the angle from the initial witness saying that they saw two black males in a gray car fleet. So we kind of try to work backwards the things we do know, which is the victim's identity. We tried to speak with family or friends or get any idea of who he was, where he was, why he would be there. His mom said he was staying at 5 Boggs Avenue, which is in very close distance, within a mile and a half or so of the murder scene. So our next move was to go to that area. At the apartment, police are met by Savion's devastated girlfriend and their roommate. The couple's roommate tells police he last saw Savion the day before, and he'd noticed Savion was acting strange his roommate, tells officers that Savion was a small-time drug dealer that sold a little bit, you know, here and there to help cover the rent. He also mentions that earlier in the day, Savion had left to go sell some Xanax to a woman. He never told his roommate the name of the woman, but one thing that his roommate did note was that when Savion got home, he had a bunch of cash on him. Savion seemed happy with the deal he'd struck. 
But later that afternoon, there was a knock at the door. According to the roommate, Sabian answered the door and went outside. Savion's roommate said that he went to the window to take a peek at what was going on. He said he saw Savion climb into the passenger seat of a Ford Focus with two men in the back seat and a woman behind the wheel. And that's the last time the witnesses see Savion. Savion's roommate didn't recognize any of the individuals in the car. Yet his information is still vital for the investigation. So now, armed with that, we have a pretty good idea that this is a murder probably based on a drug deal gone bad. The description of the car matched the one the witness saw at the crime scene. So police were pretty sure that these individuals were Savion's killers. But who are the three suspects? Detectives immediately get to work trying to find out. We do a canvas for surveillance video. It's very common. We do it all the time. Right off the bat, we get this video from one of the businesses right on that main street on Boggs. As the tape rolls, detectives bear witness to a chilling scene. We were able to obtain video that shows the victim actually bail out of a moving car. And then two black males exit the vehicle on each side and chase him. He runs up the back of the building it's a pretty steep hill, and you can really see the fear in the victim, and you can see that he's running for his life. It was a pretty intense, let's say, foot chase, at which point a third suspect stayed in the vehicle and drove around almost in an attempt to either cut him off or an attempt to gain an advantage on catching him on the other side of this steep hill. He eventually runs around this building. And then in the rear of the building, the surveillance doesn't actually show where they recapture him. But it does show shortly thereafter, they're walking him down, holding him by the arms. And you can see he's out of breath, that he really wanted to get away. He realized that this situation could end badly. It's a harrowing scene that's difficult for even the most seasoned investigators to watch. We obviously know that Savion was murdered, and so what we're looking at is the last few moments of his life. The video also provides a key piece of evidence. The video is very clear and very close, and uh, you're able to see everyone's face. The footage provided a description of all three suspects, but even more importantly, it gave them the license plate of the Ford Focus. We got the license plate off her car, and that's how we identified her. Erica Harris. The name doesn't ring any bells for homicide detectives. We didn't know her prior to this day. I didn't have any interaction with her, nor did any of my partners or colleagues that I'm aware of. Looking into Erica's background, she doesn't seem like a hardened criminal. On the contrary, 24-year-old Erica Harris appears to be a happy, well-adjusted young woman on the path to success. Growing up, Erica lived a very soft life, as some people would say. Her and her father had a really great relationship. She was referred to as daddy's little angel by so many people that knew them. We found out she had a steady job. She seemed like she was organized and fairly intelligent. She seemed to care about her family and her friends. She was going to go to school, and she seemed like someone that had her own thing going on. But behind closed doors, Erica was still suffering from the tragedy of losing her father just a couple years earlier. Sadly, when her father died, that changed everything for Erica. Her whole life, you know, just felt shattered, and things really got out of control. Typically, we associate our fathers with security, and safety and protection. So those are some of the really important things that would be missing if suddenly her father is no longer around, who's there to make her feel secure and to make her feel unconditionally loved. Erica tried to soldier on, but life wasn't the same without the person who mattered most to her. Trauma impacts us in every way that you can think about, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally. Some people may hide inward, but others 
will externalize their trauma. So they might run for the bad boys or engage in more risque behaviors. Erica longed to find someone to fill the hole in her heart. And she finally did when she met 21-year-old Mitchell Coles. When they met, it was like an instant connection. Like, you were the person I've always been looking for. She thought he was going to be the one the one that was going to provide, the one that was going to get her life back on track. You could tell that she did have a lot invested in their relationship and that they cared about each other and they were very intimate and just very close. But there was a side of Mitchell that gave Erica pause. Unfortunately, Mitchell was a drug dealer and Erica wasn't a fan of that at all. But what could she do? She loved him. And the sense of security and safety that provided was beyond anything she ever imagined. She saw him as a loving man, someone that she could build a future with. And they had a connection. There was a bond there outside of the drug dealing. There were so many other things that came with his life that was rewarding for her. But now, detectives are wondering, did Mitchell Coles drag Erica into his life of crime? Mitchell had a fairly violent criminal history. He was involved in shootings, firearms violations, stuff like that. And when investigators roll back the tape of Savion's abduction, they find their answer. We look at the surveillance video of the individuals chasing Savion Ponder, and one of the individuals appears to be Mitchell Coles. You can see it as clear as day that it was him. March 2016, after discovering surveillance video of 21-year-old Savion Scott Ponder's abduction, Pittsburgh police have identified Erica Harris as one of three suspects in Savion's murder. You can look at it and say, oh, it's very clear that that's her vehicle being so distinct and being right on video. There's a nail and coffin. Police believe that Erica's boyfriend, Mitchell Coles, is one of the other individuals caught on tape. Well, we had evidence from the video surveillance that he intentionally ran after him, caught up to him, and forcibly dragged him back to the vehicle. Now, detectives are ready to take their suspects into custody. Two detectives in our office took a ride up through the north side to an area where they knew Mitchell Coles to be living at and observed the gray Ford out front. So they called for backup, and some other officers and detectives arrived including myself. They found both suspects inside, and they surrendered without incident. At this point, both Erica and Mitchell are taken to the police department and then transferred over for interrogation. The detectives decide to start with Erica. Once we brought Erica back to interview her, she sat in the room, she was very cold, she almost pretended like this wasn't that big of a deal, and she seemed to be oddly calm. The best way I can describe it, when someone comes in, you offer them water or a drink or Pepsi or a cigarette. But when you interview innocent people, they generally are very frightened and don't really want anything. We actually offered Erica an ice cream sandwich, and she took it, which we found to be very strange. I remember me and Detective Kale were like, man, nobody's taken the ice cream sandwich before. We're talking about a murder and she's eating an ice cream sandwich. While Erica's behavior raises red flags, she refrains from admitting any wrongdoing. Erica remains composed the entire time as she disavows any knowledge of Savion's abduction and later murder. She tells detectives she has nothing to say. That's when investigators offer to cut her a deal. It's called Queen for a Day, and it means that you can come in, say all your involvement, implicate as many people as you can in exchange for a reduced sentence. It's basically a get out of jail free card, but Erica wasn't biting. She wouldn't answer any questions. She was just not helpful. Eventually, she lawyered up, and then she was arrested and charged and taken to the county jail. 
With Erica refusing to talk, detectives turn their attention to her boyfriend, Mitchell Coles. But just like Erica, Mitchell Coles says he doesn't know what's going on. He started with, I wasn't there, I don't know who this is. And then once she's presented with the evidence that we had, he realized that if he says something, that maybe he could talk his way out of it. Detectives pull out the footage and show Mitchell chasing Savion down when Savion gets out the car. So at this point, they're expecting the confession. Instead, Mitchell says that they were racing. While Mitchell never admits to being involved in Savion's murder, his absurd claim about racing does give the investigators more ammunition to use against him. He puts himself on the scene. He's not denying it's him. He also said Erica had nothing to do with it. All she did was drive. So of course, he implicates her as being part of what occurred. It was huge, because whenever you can cooperate any evidence, I mean, we had the video surveillance of her vehicle. We had her in the driver's seat, and we had Mitchell putting her there putting her basically at the crime the whole time. But there's another huge piece of this puzzle that's still missing. We knew there was a third actor involved. Who was the man that was in the car when Mitchell and Eric? Detectives are about to find out from the last place they could have imagined. We received information that was really important to us. Erica had a change of heart. She's now willing to cooperate and give them everything. In March of 2016, Pittsburgh police have arrested two individuals in the shooting murder of Savion Scott Ponder. Erica Harris and Mitchell Coles. We had a massive amount of evidence we were able to compile against them. Erica was in love, and so she was willing to do anything. She put a lot of her feelings and even common sense aside to be by her man. Detectives believe another unidentified man helped the couple commit their crime. But so far, Erica and Mitchell have refused to give up his name. There was a lack of willing to play ball. Without their cooperation, police had no way of identifying who the man in surveillance video was. It was kind of fruitless at that point. But then, the investigators received surprising news from the county jail. Once she was in jail, Erica found out she was pregnant. Mitchell, the co-defendant, is, is the dad. The realization that she's carrying a child forces Erica to reevaluate her situation. Finding out that you're pregnant changes a lot for you. Because now you're no longer thinking about you. You're thinking about your child. That is pivotal on what her next moves are going to be because she is now about to become a parent. Although Erica was previously willing to stand by Mitchell till the end, she now signals to the investigators that she's ready to cut a deal. The idea of being pregnant while in jail has got to be terrifying, right? And I imagine that gave her a new perspective on life, and that must have been that shift. Like, let me now say something. If it'll save me and my baby in any way, so she comes in with her attorney. We have the district attorney. And she agrees to give the statement with a number of stipulations. First and foremost, Erica is required to tell police everything she knows about the murder of Savion Scott Ponder. Also, she had to give up her consent to having her phone forensically downloaded for the content. But for Erica, the most troubling condition of all comes last. Part of the deal was for reduced charges that she was going to not have further communications with Mr. Coles while he was in jail. For someone like Erica not being able to talk to someone you see as the love of your life, that might have been a worse sentence than prison. Keep in mind, she's pregnant. If you thought they were close before the incident, 
This is now a bond that's way beyond anything they felt before. With no other options on the table, Erica reluctantly agrees to the deal. And before long, she's sitting down with investigators to tell them exactly what happened on the night of Savion's death. According to Erica, this all started when she agreed to run an errand for her boyfriend. She would do anything Mitchell asked her. This time she agreed to go pick up some drugs from Savion. She loved them and she wants to prove her love to them. So she ran the errand. It just so happened instead of getting a gallon of milk, she was going to buy weed. Erica tells the detectives that Mitchell gave her $800 in cash, along with Savion's address. So basically, she was simply supposed to pick up these drugs from Savion in and out. She believes she's buying marijuana that can then be resold, at which point, once the transaction occurs, Ponder gives her Xanax instead of marijuana. Erica attempts to say she doesn't want the Xanax, she wants marijuana, at which point, Ponder tells her, you get what you get, you're out. She gave him this money, and she didn't get her drugs. So trouble was afoot. She calls Mitchell and says, hey, our guy just burned me for $800. Erica says that call started a chain of events she never saw coming. Mitchell was furious, and he was determined to get his money back by any means necessary. I don't know what was going through her mind at that point, but I can't imagine that she thought that anything good was going to happen to Ponder by getting Mitchell Coles involved. Before confronting Savion, Mitchell decided to recruit some extra muscle. Erica says this is the person that was in the car with them, the person who was on the surveillance video. And she tells the police his name is Johnny Rains. Mitchell and him had a long relationship. They were associates. They had been shot together. So they have been involved in this criminal life together. Erica tells the detectives she was worried about what the two men were going to do to Savion, but not worried enough to back out of the plan. She is just so blinded by the fact that she would do anything for her man. This is the man that stepped in when her father was gone. This is the man that she was in love with. So Erica agreed to drive Mitchell and Johnny to Savion's apartment. They told Savion to get them their money or else. At that point, it doesn't go so well. Mr. Ponder had subsequently used that 800, threw in another 100 of his own, and bought $900 worth of Xanax pills. At that point, he didn't have the marijuana to give them for money. Mitchell and Johnny forced Savion into the passenger seat of Erica's car. And they drive around for him to try to either get the marijuana or get the money back from the Xanax. Savion knows he's in trouble. And he tries to remedy the situation. Initially, he tries to sell the Xanax back to the person he bought it from. They're like, forget it. You did this deal. We're not giving you your money back. When that became apparent to Mr. Cole and Mr. Rains that they weren't getting their money back, that's when things started to escalate. That is when Savion flees the vehicle and runs until they capture him. So that amps up the energy in the situation. They are angry. After Savion's escape attempt, Erica says Mitchell was done messing around. Once they get back in that car, the mood is different. The situation just escalated and kept escalating and escalating. Mitchell tells Erica that they need to go to Belsuver. One way or another, Savion was going to pay. The next thing you know, she's hearing gunshots. April 2016, a month after Savion Scott Ponder was found shot to death, Erica Harris has agreed to tell the Pittsburgh police everything she knows about the homicide. Erica and Mitchell, what they were trying to do was recoup the money that they had believed they had been burnt. The victim had 
not given them the marijuana that they believed they were supposed to purchase. Erica has told investigators that, despite her misgivings, she agreed to go along with her boyfriend's plan to make Savion pay. When emotions are high, logic is low. Erica really was someone who prioritized Mitchell. She loved him, and she was very much invested in protecting him. Any hesitation Erica had was drowned out by her desire to do anything to help her man. So when Mitchell ordered her to drive to a secluded area in South Pittsburgh, Erica did as she was told. Erica's fear level was rising, not knowing what would happen next and not knowing what Mitchell would do. She was thinking, maybe he's going to beat him up. But you also have to think in your mind, I don't know how far this could go. Erica says she waited in the car while Mitchell and his friend Johnny Rains led Savion into the woods. They hook him up under the arms and they escort him. Essentially, they're walking him to his death. Savion had to be terrified out of his mind. Any doubts Erica had about what her boyfriend was going to do to Savion were quickly dispelled. She heard gunshots coming from the woods. Not long after that, Mitchell and Johnny walked back from the woods and they were carrying Savion's shoes, but Savion was not with them. On the drive home, Erica says neither of the men said a word. She said it was quiet. They didn't really talk about it. They didn't know what to say. But which of the two men pulled the trigger? Investigators hope that Johnny Rains may provide the answer. We were able to get a warrant for Johnny Rains as the third accomplice. And the next day, we went out and got him. Detectives questioned Johnny about what happened after he and Mitchell walked into the woods with Savion. But despite undergoing hours of rigorous interrogation, Johnny remains tight-lipped. He didn't make a statement either, and to date he's never made a statement about his guilt or his participation. That's a big problem for this investigation, because it's tough to convict somebody of murder if you don't actually know who the shooter is. With Johnny refusing to talk, the investigators decide to take another swing at Mitchell Coles. Once Mitchell heard Erica was talking, he told detectives he wanted a plea deal of his own. Part of Mitchell's plea bargain was that he gave up all the information, that he took a step-by-step -step through the case. So Mitchell came in and gave us a second interview, which he detailed how Savion was murdered. Mitchell's story picks up where Erica's left off, as he and Johnny Rains walked Savion into the woods in Beltsover. They got him out, walked him in. I want to say it was about 30 to 50 feet, maybe. I would assume they were trying to just get as secluded as they could. Mitchell rationalizes it by telling us that you got to do what you got to do. There's bills that need paid. You're not ripping me off. I think Savion knew what was about to happen. He knows they're armed. They're agitated because he ran. He has to know that he's either going to get beaten severely or, or killed. According to Mitchell, Savion's terror was plain to see. He's talking, and Mitchell flat out asks him, what are you doing? He's like, I'm praying. He's praying that they're not going to hurt him because he had full intentions of trying to make it right. He was trying to do anything he could that they wouldn't harm him. But Mitchell and Johnny had no intentions of letting Savion go. That's when Johnny Rains takes Ponder's shoes off of him they remove his shoes in an attempt for him not to attempt to escape again. And then Savion says to them, like, what are you going to do now? Are you going to pistol with me? Are you going to beat my ass? That's when Mitchell's like, when well, we have to do something here. It's the end of the road. By the spring of 2016, Pittsburgh police have arrested three suspects for the murder of Savion Scott Ponder, Erica Harris, Mitchell Coles, 
and Johnny Rains. Investigators have all three perps in custody. Now, after learning that his girlfriend is cooperating with the investigators, Mitchell Coles has agreed to provide a statement of his own. He admits that he and his friend, Johnny Rains, forced Savion into the woods. That's when Mitchell's like, when well, we have to do something here. It's the end of the road, and then Mitchell produces that gun, and it's all, it's all over for him. He says, I just, you know, I take the gun out and I shoot him. But according to Mitchell, he wasn't the only one who shot Savion. During the second interview of Mitchell Coles, he indicates that he shot Savion multiple times and handed the gun to Johnny. He gave the gun to Johnny Rains, who then emptied the clip onto Savion. And that was incredibly chilling during that interview of Mr. Coles. It was Stone Cold Killer at that point. Mitchell's statement clears up any remaining doubt about what happened to Savion. We knew there was one gun used, but we didn't really know how that sequence went down until Mitchell comes in and tells us. I can't get into their head to why they did that. I would just have to assume or to think that Mitchell wanted Johnny to be as culpable in the homicide as he was. So if he fired into the victim as well, it would also make him part of the murder. We do believe Mitchell because it did fit what happened. It fit the details of the case. The way the scene was and the sound of like, emptying the gun from the witnesses, his story did fit. Following his confession, Mitchell Coles pleads guilty to conspiracy, kidnapping, and third-degree murder. In the state of Pennsylvania, there's three degrees of homicide. There's first-degree murder, and that's the one we all think about when you think of a premeditated murder. Second-degree murder is when someone is murdered in the commission of a felony. Third-degree murder would be any other sort of murder where your actions, you intended to kill that person. Mitchell's statement also seals the fate of Johnny Rains. That same month, Johnny Rains pleads guilty as well. I think once he realized that, you know, Erica had given us a statement and then Mitchell gave us a statement, I think the writing was on the wall. Both men are sentenced to serve up to 50 years in prison. But the last of the three defendants, Erica Harris, is anticipating a far milder punishment. Ultimately, she was charged with the kidnapping. The reason why Erica is not facing a murder charge is because of the fact that she agreed with prosecutors to not have any contact with her boyfriend, Mitchell Coles, during the entire investigation. However, as her sentencing date draws near, investigators learn that Erica hasn't been keeping up her end of the bargain. We realized that she'd still been talking to Mitchell on the phone. We monitor jail communications, you know, phone calls. So we know they're communicating and they still had a relationship. You know, they were still saying, I love you, still communicating against the agreement. Erica's kidnapping charges are now upgraded to include the same third-degree murder charges as Mitchell and Johnny. And so the judge changed the sentencing based on her actions. When she broke the rule or the stipulations that the judge gave her, the good deal that we were going to give you, you can't get anymore. The gravity of Erica's mistake doesn't fully sink in until she goes before a judge in August of 2017. I remember when Erica Harris was sentenced, it seemed like she was almost shocked. We were in the courtroom, and the judge handed her down a sentence of 20 to 45 years. Once all the circumstances and the facts of the case came out, the judge realized that even though she didn't pull the trigger, she had just as much culpability in this homicide as the other two did. Savion's family is relieved to learn that none of their loved one's killers are going to get off easy. When we spoke to them when the sentencing was happening, nothing we do, no sentence we're going to give them is going to make them whole again. They lost their son, their boyfriend, their best friend, their loved one. We're never going to fix that. But I think some closure comes in the fact that we got substantial sentences on everybody involved, including the driver, Ms. Harris. As for Erica Harris, she'll have decades behind bars to reflect on where she went wrong. 
There were so many opportunities along the way for her to have pulled back and just in Virginia. Single mom Jody Hope has finally found the perfect husband and father to her three children. She believes this is it. This is the man I am meant to be with for the rest of my life. But when outsiders threaten her love, she's ready to fight tooth and nail to protect him. This goes from being a simple argument into something a lot more sinister. She was willing to risk anything to defend him, no matter what the cost. And later, in South Carolina, thinking she's found the man of her dreams, Kendra Goodman goes above and beyond to prove her devotion. He was out of her league, and she was willing to do what she had to do. But when her lover commits a horrific crime, she must decide how far she's willing to go to have him all to herself. Kendra thought that if she helped Teddy, he would love her more. She got blood on her hands for him. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. Raised in Southside, Richmond, Virginia, little Jody Hope's life is tougher than most. She had a rough childhood. Like, everybody was addicted to drugs. Crime was at an all-time high. She lives with her mother at her grandmother's house while her father has a place down the street. Yet she's surrounded by constant drug use and neglect. Jody's mother had a $300 a day heroin addiction. And she was so worried about feeding her addiction that there was nothing else. Then, at 12 years old, her life takes a tragic turn for the worse. Jody's mom was high off of heroin and went to Jody's father's house and ended up in a huge argument and stabbed Jody's dad to death with a knife. Her mother was ultimately convicted and she was given a life sentence plus 20 years. In one fell swoop, Jody lost both her mom and her dad in a very traumatic event. Without her parents, she stays permanently with her grandmother. But the young girl is confused by her mother's horrendous actions. Jody felt abandoned, so she felt raw rage at her mother. But most importantly, she really felt alone. She doesn't have either of her parents there. She is left without guidance. She's left without role models. The following year, Jody begins acting out. She skips school and gets into fights on a regular basis. Like any teenage girl do rebelling. You going through puberty, other kids got more than you got. But after three years of getting into trouble, the defiant teen has an epiphany. Around 16, Jody decided, she made a conscious decision, I'm not going to end up where my mom is. Jody was a strong-willed and a strong-minded person. And whatever she set her mind to, she was going to do it. She was going to accomplish it. Then one day while in school, she learns about a program called Job Corps. She knows this is the opportunity she's been waiting for. Job Corps is a wonderful organization that helps low-income children with their education get a job and keep a job. They train them. The lost girl immediately signs up. And through the group, she's able to turn her life around. By the time she's 20, the former juvenile delinquent has earned her GED and is a certified nursing assistant, working at Virginia Commonwealth University's medical center. So her life has started to fall into place, and so I think the last piece for her was a husband. Yet after several failed relationships, she finds herself on her own again, with a few small additions. By the time she's 28, she's renting an apartment with one of her cousins and has three children by three different men. Jody was looking for love, and she was looking for the right man, but she hadn't found him yet. Although it's tough raising her children on one income, Jody loves being a mother. Her kids are the stars of her life, and she wants the best for them. She was bound and determined to give her children everything she didn't receive when she was growing up. Building a family and doing the right thing was everything to her. She just wanted a father figure for her kids, and she wanted a husband. And she's about to find him. 
One day that spring, she stops by the Southside Plaza shopping center to get a gift for her little ones. Southside Plaza is the hottest outside. They got everything out there. You got people out there selling DVDs, incense, clothes. You, you never know what you might buy out there running to. There she meets 32-year-old Trent Hopkins, a car salesman whose sideline is selling bootleg DVDs and CDs out of the trunk of his car. Being on a tight budget, Jody checks out his selection and the two immediately hit it off and get deep. She can't believe how much they have in common. They were both hard workers. They were both caring and loving. With the help of his mother, he was raising two children of his own. She saw everything a, a person could want in a man. Although he reluctantly admits to her that he's been in trouble in the past. He had a criminal record for possession with intent to distribute, as well as simple possession of narcotics. He made some mistakes early on in life, but just like Jody, decided to turn his life around. The former wild child knows better than anyone how hard it is to make positive changes. Jody and Trent, in many ways, were simpatico. She saw a lot of her very difficult upbringing and what she had gone through with what Trent had gone through. She realizes she's finally found her soulmate. Jody stayed on the telephone 24 7 when she first met him. They had a real love. For the next three years, the couple falls deeper in love. Jody really cherished the relationship that she had with him and with the family that they had built, and I think she certainly would do anything to protect that. So one day when Trent pops the question, Jody doesn't hesitate to say yes. They set a date for the following July, and she and her kids move in with him and his mother. It's the complete family she's always dreamed of. He was the one man in the world who gave Jody everything, everything her heart wanted. He provided not just the husband figure, but a father figure for her kids, and also brought with him a mother figure for Jody. And now that she's found her perfect mate, she's not about to let anyone come between them and their happy future. Instead of fleeing, Jody stood her ground. There wasn't anything she wouldn't do for him. She was willing to risk everything. In Richmond, Virginia, after surviving a traumatic childhood, Jody Hope has finally found the man of her dreams in her fiance, Trent Hopkins. Jody lost what family she had when she was 12. But now, with that simple marriage proposal, he has stated, I will love you forever. And that is what Jody was looking for. For Jody, this is a win-win. Not only does she get a guy in Trent, but she also gets a mother she never had by having Trent's mom, her future mother-in-law. For the next two months, life is good for the couple as they plan for their upcoming nuptials. Although Trent's DVD business isn't prospering as well as it used to, thanks to local rivals, the Harris brothers, who also sell bootlegged CDs and DVDs at the shopping center. His primary competition in Southside Plaza uh, was Dorsey and Antonio Harris. He and Dorsey knew each other. For some people, this is their only job, their only income of making money for their family and taking care of their kids. To stay ahead of the game, Trent slashes his prices. He decided to sell two CDs or DVDs for $5 versus the brothers selling one CD for $5. And that's when everything came to a head. I guess the tension started mounting when their money started slowing up. So one day that April, while Jody's fiance is working at the plaza, the brothers decide to do something about it. Around 5 p.m., Trent orders a salad for dinner at the pizza joint. As he waits for it outside, he comes face to face with Dorsey Harris. Dorsey told him he needed to stop undercutting their business because he was taking money out of their mouth. Then I think Antonio got behind him. And then that's when the assault began. Dorsey hit him in the face um, and brandished a knife. Knowing this is a fight he would probably lose, Trent takes off on foot to put distance between them. You better not come around here. He left his car, he ran to the other end of the plaza. But it's not over yet. Dorsey was still angry, and he went over and he slashed all four of his tires. 
When Trent returns ten minutes later, the brothers are gone. And he's shocked to see all of his tires are flat. He gets his car towed to a local repair shop to cross his mother's house and while those tires are being replaced. He tells her what happens. She's like any other mom. She's worried about her son. She's upset. You have to do something. But he tells his mom, I'll take care of it. I gotta pick up. An hour later, Trent leaves to pick up his car from the shop, while his mother, Muriel, calls Jody at work and tells her what happened. Concerned about her future husband, she immediately cuts her shift short. Jody got permission, left the hospital, um, and made her way to Southside Plaza. Jody was hypersensitive of protecting the family members around her, especially because she had been through the trauma of not being able to protect her father from being killed from her mother. When she arrives around 8 p.m., she's surprised to bump into her future mother-in-law. His mother goes to the plaza to kind of investigate what's gone on with her son at this point. But all is quiet. Since she's there, she picks up the salad Trent ordered earlier that evening. As she heads to her car, she dials up her fiancé on the Bluetooth, when suddenly she turns to see Muriel outside the pizza place in a heated argument with two very large men. There was some words exchanged about the fact that he had sent his mother and girlfriend to handle his dirty work. Jody sees this, becomes concerned. She realized these are probably the same characters who assaulted Trent, and she wasn't going to take anything lying down. Luckily, she keeps a gun in her glove compartment for protection after she was mugged earlier in the year. She sees what's going on, grabs her gun, puts it in her nurse's smock, and so she walks up and uh, begins to, to ask what's happening, what's going on. Still on the phone with her fiancé, he hears what's going on and hightails it to Southside Plaza, concerned that the two most important women in his life are in danger. Ten minutes later, Trent shows up, but he's not alone. He's brought back up. He has a friend of his with him. The two of them approach, and there is another, I guess, verbal exchange. The six square off. Dorsey flashes his switchblade, but when Trent's friend Johnny reveals the gun tucked into his waistband, the situation cools down fast. For all intents and purposes, things kind of get diffused. The, the situation gets quashed. So he takes his friend, um, ensures that Jody and his mother are leaving, and he takes off. But taking the chance to further intimidate, the brothers alarmingly stalk the pair. Jody hears uh, the two Harris brothers approaching behind her, and so she gets a little bit concerned. With each step, her pulse quickens. And when the brothers suddenly unleash a mouthful of threats, she becomes petrified. Dorsey and Antonio start saying stuff like, yeah, you need to say your last goodbyes tonight, bitch, because I'm gonna kill you. I know where y'all live at. She especially gets concerned when she hears one of these brothers saying, you can go ahead and say goodbye to your boyfriend. No more. One of them has his hands in his pockets, so I don't think she really knows what's coming next. That's when something in her snaps. This goes from being a simple argument into something a lot more sinister. Later, in Columbia, South Carolina, Kendra Goodman's desire to be her lover's one and only causes her to compromise her own morals to protect him. Kendra just thought that he would see this as dedication to him. She clearly was doing everything for this guy that she was hoping would ultimately be her man. In Richmond, Virginia, Jody hopes not about to let the Harris brothers threaten her fiance and the future they're building together. She pulls out her gun. She extends her arm towards them. And at this point, Jody is seeing her dreams evaporate. I don't think Jody was mad. I think she was scared. I think she just panicked. She fires shots at them. Um, she fires 11 shots. She basically holds the trigger until the gun's empty. Six bullets reach their target. One shot hit Dorsey in his left arm, and then five shots hit his brother Antonio in the buttocks, the hands, and his neck, and both fell on the ground, 
in the parking lot. But Dorsey doesn't stay down for long. He'd only been hit in the arm. He sees that his brother is on the ground. He then asks somebody to call an ambulance. Frightened, Jody's future mother-in-law heads to her car and makes her way home. With her gun in hand, Jody walks to her suburban in a daze and drives out of the plaza. I believe Jody was in shock. Uh, she just shot two men to protect her family, to protect her man. And now she's dealing with the aftermath, and she's probably just numb. Within seconds, a crowd of onlookers quickly converge on the scene and run to Antonio's aid. The police get called almost immediately. And there are people running from all directions to try and help. Two people actually start trying to do CPR on him until the ambulance ultimately arrives and is able to transport Antonio to the hospital. An APB is put out on the shooter and her vehicle. She's pulled over, I think, less than a couple blocks from the plaza. She doesn't resist as she's quickly arrested for malicious wounding and the use of a firearm and brought to the police station. I was shocked when I heard it because if anybody know Joe, that she's not no person that's going to use a weapon unless she have to. So you had it scared. Jody must have been holding on to a lot of anger, a lot of disappointment, a lot of frustration, especially around her life, especially around the loss of her father and the person who took her father's life. Despite what she did, Trent stands by her side. He kept in contact with her while she was at the Richmond City Jail. I think it shows you how important love is. One week later, while Jody sits in her jail cell, Dorsey Harris loses full use of his left hand after multiple surgeries. His brother, Antonio, dies in the hospital from his wounds. Jody was sorry. Jody didn't want to take nobody's life. That's not her intention, to take nobody's life, to kill nobody. She is officially charged with aggravated malicious wounding, two counts of use of a firearm in commission of a crime, and first-degree murder. Neither Trent nor his mother are implicated in the crime at all. That October, Jody goes to trial and pleads not guilty to all charges, stating that she fired in self-defense. The love of her life, Trent, testifies the same on her behalf. Unfortunately, the outcome isn't what they hoped for. The jury found her guilty of second-degree murder. Um, they convicted her of aggravated malicious wounding, and they convicted her of both of the attendant firearms charges. Jody Hope is sentenced to 48 years in the same women's prison as her mother. It's the last thing Jody wanted to, to end up like her mom. That who would want to end up in prison for the rest of their life? No one. 2020 hindsight tells us perhaps she had gotten that therapy to be able to work through those issues. Certainly, she wouldn't have given up her own freedom, her own life, her own future. Though she feels like she did the right thing protecting those she loved, she regrets taking a life. She does feel remorse that Antonio died. She does feel remorse that Dorsey um, has this injury that he's going to have to live with for the rest of his life. But I don't think that Jody feels like she did anything wrong. Jody saw her entire dream, her entire life going up in smoke. And she would do anything to protect it. And that's what she did. Jody Hope unleashed a fury she didn't know was in her for the chance of having a future with the love of her life. In South Carolina, Kendra Goodman will sacrifice her own future to protect her love. Born into a military family in Columbia, South Carolina, Kendra moves around through most of her youth, but always considered the South her home. Kendra's from a Columbia suburb called Irmo. Uh, just outside of town. She seems to have normal parents. Seemed to be a normal background. Kendra came from uh, a stable home. There's just a ton of uh, salt of the earth, good people here. I mean, there's churches on every corner. People believe in the good book. Those strong Southern values serve her well as she makes her way through high school. She was a sweet girl. She was warm. She was hardworking. Even though she hits a few snags along the way, she manages to keep her head on straight. By the time she's 22 years old, she's a single mom living in a small apartment and works at a dry cleaners to support her kids. 
She was the mother of two, and she was on her own. She did her best to take care of her children. But it's not easy, and she finds herself barely making ends meet. Not to mention, she has little time for romance. Kenda wanted to be loved. She needed a father figure for her children. And she had a lot of misfires, the relationships that did not work out. So one day, when 24-year-old Theodore Teddy Manning walks into the dry cleaners during her shift, Kendra takes notice. In fact, she can't take her eyes off of him. He was charming. He was handsome. I don't want to say charismatic, but, but he had a charm to him that you could see. He appeared to be very intelligent. Teddy was a good-looking guy, in good shape, and he uh, definitely thought of himself as a uh, Casanova. As the two engage in conversation, she learns he's an Air Force veteran who works with nuclear rods at the power plant down the road. She's instantly smitten. Kendra saw Teddy as the guy who could rescue her and her children from struggling financially. And of course, it didn't hurt that he was pretty good looking too. Unfortunately, she can tell her Romeo isn't interested in anything romantic, but she's not giving up that easy. Then one hot and steamy night, her patience finally pays off when their friendship makes its way to the bedroom. Kendra's on cloud nine and in love like never before. She's just happy to be getting a taste and hoping that maybe somehow she could convince him that she is the woman for him. But Teddy's not one to be tied down. Kendra had to know uh, that he was seeing other women, but I think that she could dismiss other women because she was so infatuated with Teddy. And three months into their romantic relationship, while on a dating website, he connects with another woman, 30-year-old Nikki McFadder. She was a very upstanding person. She worked for US Air as a ticket agent, was very well liked, very well respected, and was just a wonderful person. Nikki lived in Charlotte, which is about 90 miles from uh, Columbia. And so her and um, Teddy had um, a long distance uh, relationship. For the next several months, whenever he isn't with Nikki, Kendra keeps him warm at night, turning a blind eye to his other interests. Kendra knew that Teddy was a player and had not only this other woman, but probably had a several other women on the side. Then one afternoon that May, while she's working at the dry cleaners, Teddy calls in a panic. He called her frantically, saying, you've got to come over here. Please, please, I need help. She could sense he's nervous, worried, stressed. Concerned for her lover, she quickly leaves work and races to his home. When she gets there around 3 p.m., she can tell something dreadful happened. There was a trail of blood from upstairs, down the stairs, uh, and into the garage. It was impossible to miss. And what he says next will send Kendra's world spinning out of control and force her into making the most difficult decision she's ever made in the name of love. She asked what's going on. He told her not to go in the garage. Kendra would have done just about anything for him. Just about anything. In Columbia, South Carolina, Kendra Goodman is at her lover Teddy Manning's home, anxiously waiting for him to tell her why there's so much blood in his house. He confessed to her that, that he had shot and killed Nikki McFadder. Teddy explains that he'd only known Nikki for three months, and she was pushing for a lot more than he could give. That's what I said. He told her that Nikki wanted to, to, to marry him, and he did not want to do that. And they had gotten into an argument. It became physical. Somehow, she knew that he had a gun, where he kept the gun. He says in a fit of rage, Nikki grabbed the weapon he kept hidden in the bedroom closet for protection and pointed it at him. He did not want her to have the gun. He grabbed the gun, and the two struggled over the weapon. She was just enraged and crazy and was just not going to stop. During the struggle, the gun suddenly goes off. The shot that was fired ended up hitting her in the back of the head. Kendra's shocked. 
and unable to speak as Teddy explains to her it was an accident. The horrific story doesn't end there. After he realized Nikki was dead, he panicked and dragged her into the garage, which explains the trail of blood. He had to move her car into the garage and literally put her in the trunk of her own car. I didn't mean to do it. He plucks at her heartstrings, saying that if she helps him clean up all traces of Nikki, then they can finally be together. This problem. Teddy tells her that, that he needed her help because he didn't think anyone would believe him that it was an accident. She has been hoping and hoping that she could get next to this man. And here is her chance to prove that, hey, babe, I will do anything for you. The lovelornness takes a deep breath, smiles, and says she'll do it. She'll help him clean it all up. She didn't commit the murder. So in her mind, it became easier for her to help him to try to get away with it because she didn't have to deal with the guilt of actually being the person who killed this woman. Need to get some bleach. Grateful, Teddy says the first thing they need to do is go shopping. Together, they head to the closest store and buy some bleach. Kendra actually purchased the bleach. Now, Teddy didn't even reach into his own wallet. I mean, she, she was doing whatever he wanted. They immediately head back to his house to erase all evidence that a crime took place. It was a bloody mess, so they had to clean up the house. The hallway and bedroom had a linoleum floor, which is more easily cleaned up with bleach, so they were able to do a, a decent job. Once they wash the blood from their hands, Teddy tells her to follow him in her vehicle while he drives Nikki's car with her body in the trunk. He says he has an idea on how to get rid of it. Kendra doesn't hesitate, and the two head out. She tried to prove to him that she was loyal, and therefore, perhaps, he would choose her over any other woman in his life. With no idea what he's got up his sleeve, she faithfully follows her lover as he drives north for 30 miles to a neighboring rural county. They find a, a small country church. Uh, there's a trail leading behind the church, uh, several thousand yards back into a wooded area. Kendra pulls in behind Teddy as he parks Nikki's car. She sees him get out and head towards her with something in his hands. When uh, Teddy returns to her vehicle after dumping the car, he had a gas can. Don't worry, you're pretty little ass. He says he needs gasoline, and the two drive to the closest gas station. That's when Teddy notices a bank next door. He tells her they need to make one more quick stop. He used Nikki McFadder's debit card. He withdrew five to $600. Teddy knew about Kendra's financial situation and offered to give her some of the money. It's kind of a reward. Like, you had my back, now I'm going to help you. She then drives them back to the remote road behind the church, but Teddy asks her to stop just short of where he left Nikki's car. He's missing an important piece to continue with his plan. He asks for a lighter, at which point Kendra gives him a lighter Teddy tells Kendra to wait in her car as he walks back to the location where he had dumped Nikki in her vehicle. Teddy walks off. There's a, a brief period there where she loses sight of him. She's not sure what he's going to do. Suddenly, there's a loud boom. She hears an explosion, sees smoke. Kendra really loved Teddy and would do anything to help him. She was blinded by love, or what she thought was love. After Teddy Manning kills Nikki McFadder in Columbia, South Carolina, he enlists the help of his lover, Kendra Goodman, to clean up his mess. With Nikki's dead body in the trunk of her car, the couple wants to make doubly sure that no one finds it. He took Nikki's car down the trail and lights the car on fire. She sees smoke and hears the explosion. She knows what happened. Just six hours after Teddy shot her in the back of the head, Nikki's body and her car go up in flames. As she stares at the smoke, Teddy suddenly comes into view and all of her apprehension fades away. When Teddy returned to the car and met up with Kendra, they were almost excited. The pair return to Teddy's house and are eager to celebrate. They have sexual intercourse. In Kendra's mind, 
she had just shown Teddy how dedicated she was and removed another competitor. She is going to be the one for, for Teddy now, and she's probably very happy about that. As a matter of fact, they had sex in the same location where the body was. So in many ways, it was a positive reinforcement for anything she did for him. The next day, Teddy takes the bottle of bleach they bought together to clean the blood up with and hands it to Kendra. He tells her she has no ties to Nikki and should keep it at her place. That way, if police question him, he won't have anything to make them suspicious. He's got to know in the, in the back of his mind that if they start getting wise to him, that bleach is going to be evidence. And better she have the evidence than he had the evidence. He told her to go back to work, pretend like nothing's happened, and let's move on with our lives. If anybody contacts you, let me know. And when several days go by, they believe they're home free. They thought that they had gotten away with murder. Meanwhile, in Nikki's hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina, her friends and co-workers are worried sick when she hasn't shown up for work in four days. She was misreliable, and when she didn't show up, that was very out of character for her, and they called the police. Charlotte police go to Nikki's house and find no signs of her or her car anywhere. But when they talk to her friends, they learn that Nikki has a secret lover in South Carolina. They didn't know the man. They knew his name, his first name, Teddy. She had told them that she was going down to Columbia to, to talk to Teddy and, and I'd break up with him. And when investigators check her bank transactions and learn her debit card was last used in Columbia at an ATM, they know they're on the right trail. But when they check out the surveillance footage from the bank, it's not Nikki using her card. There was a man at the ATM machine. He uses Nikki's debit card to take out $588 from her account. Unfortunately, they can't make out his face, but that's not all they see. We could tell that there was a older model sedan, golden color. This person parked the car a short distance away from the ATM and walked up to use it. You could also see someone inside the car. Because of the video's poor quality, they can't make out who it is or the license plate. But this tells investigators one disturbing thing. It was clear to them at this point that they weren't dealing with just a disappearance, that there was, a, there was most likely a murder. Charlotte police immediately team up with Columbia authorities. And one week later, they are finally able to track down a name and number for Nikki's mysterious boyfriend, Teddy. We learned through phone records that Teddy Manning was the person she had been meeting with here in Columbia, South Carolina, whom she had told her friends about. So they knew that's the next person we got to go see. Investigators call him up, and he agrees to meet with them at his house the next day. When they arrive, he doesn't seem to have a care in the world. Teddy was very calm. While he was talking to us, he was eating chicken wings. He admits that he'd been seeing Nikki for a few months, but that it wasn't serious, and makes no attempt to hide the fact that he'd last seen her two weeks earlier in South Carolina. Teddy tells us that Nikki had driven to his house, that he did see her that day, and that he had sort of sent her on her way back to Charlotte, and that was the last time he'd seen her. He was sort of dismissing it as, I don't know anything about it. Detectives refrain from telling Teddy about the ATM footage, in case he's their guy. Instead, they ask if they can take a look around his home. Feeling confident they won't find anything, he agrees. Nothing stands out to them initially, until they get to the bedroom. They found a uh, receipt that he had bought some bleach, and it happened on the same day that they believe uh, Nikki went missing. That screamed, suspect. Believing that Nikki is dead and knowing that bleach is usually used to clean up crime scenes, detectives take a chance and question him about it. But the smooth talker is ready with an explanation. He told them basically that he had uh, bought it for a friend. So as not to seem suspicious, he gives them Kendra's name and number, confident that she'll keep her mouth shut. Detectives decide to go see what she knows, but something about Teddy's laid-back attitude doesn't sit right with them. I was thinking this guy's full of it, that uh, he's got something to do with her disappearance. As soon as police leave, Teddy calls his partner in crime and warns her to be on the lookout. He told her 
you know, the police have been talking to me about this. And then he advised her on what to say, which was basically not to admit anything. Kendra follows his orders. And when the detectives arrive later that afternoon, she's ready. Kendra was going to stick to the story. She was going to back up Teddy. She was going to do anything she had to do in order to keep this man in her life who was the ultimate catch, her savior. Kendra denied having any involvement or knowing anything about Nikki McBatter's disappearance. She denied knowing anything about anything. She obviously showed them the bleach and acknowledged that she had it, but her attitude was definitely more defensive. They felt like she was not being truthful. The detectives decide to leave her for now and do some more digging. But as they exit her apartment, they spot something that will ignite their investigation and put Kendra in the hot seat. The love that she had for him meant if she had to go down, she was willing to do that. She was enamored with him, and, and he was able to manipulate that. In Columbia, South Carolina, investigators looking for Nikki McFadder notice an important piece of the puzzle outside of Kendra Goodman's apartment. In the driveway of the apartment complex, we found a vehicle registered to Kendra that was similar to the one seen on the surveillance video. Which obviously made them incredibly suspicious at that point. Detectives instantly bring Kendra to the station for further questioning. But even with the evidence, she still denies knowing anything about Nikki's disappearance and refuses to turn on her lover. She felt like she was betraying him in the interview with us. And you could see that in her face. She still was devoted to Teddy Manning. But after endless hours of questioning, she finally cracks under pressure. At some point, she saw the light. She knew that, that she needed to, to come forward. Once Kendra's back was up against the wall, and she realized that she had been bamboozled by him to do something so heinous, reality seeped in. With the love light gone from her eyes, Kendra admits that Teddy shot Nikki and agrees to take police to the church and dirt road where he left her car. She took them right to the location. Investigators went back down that dirt road. There, police find a burned up vehicle that matches Nikki's missing car. And that's not all they uncover. The rear taillight assembly of the car is completely melted. I can actually see into the trunk of the car, although the trunk is closed. When I bend down to look in the taillight assembly of the car, I can see a human skull. 23 days after she went missing, police confirmed they found Nikki McFadder's skeletal remains and that she'd been shot in the back of her head. An entire community is devastated. Teddy took away a daughter, took away a granddaughter, took away a trusted friend, and took away just a wonderful person. I'm a father, I'm a parent. Uh, there's no worse lost in that two hours later teddy is arrested at his home and charged with first degree murder once he learns that kendra talked he reluctantly comes clean and admits it was an accident but he's quick to turn on his partner he told police that that was uh, all kendra's idea to dispose of the body and to clean up the, the house he was a smooth character he thought out everything he did before his every response to my questions was was deliberate and planned authorities arrest kendra and charge her with accessory after the fact she pleads guilty and agrees to testify against teddy that october theodore teddy manning the fourth goes to trial for first degree murder and pleads not guilty claiming self-defense his defense was that he was scared for his life but prosecutors aren't so sure in a normally in a self-defense case, the person gets shot in the front. Nikki was shot in the back of the head. Um, that does not jive with his self-defense argument. But he said to, that she spun around right when he fired the shot and that she had somehow turned during the struggle. And the jury believes him. Nine days later, Teddy is convicted of voluntary manslaughter. But he doesn't get off that easy. Mr. Manning was received the maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. 
Kendra Goodman receives three years for her role in the crime. During her testimony, she apologizes to Nikki's family. She had never done anything like this before, and she wanted Nikki's friends and family members to know what had happened and her role in it. She will forever have to live with the decision she made that day. The thing about this case that stands out the most is the willingness of Kendra to do Teddy Manning's bidding. She was willing to go completely against her good nature, her better sense, her humanity, in order to get Teddy's love, his undivided attention and love. This is a woman with two children. She absolutely put everything on the line because of a guy that she thought she was in love with. She risked her family and her future. She risked it all. In Cedartown, Georgia, 18-year-old Khadidra Cook gives up everything to play house with a young rebel. Khadidra was brainwashed by him. She just didn't care what people thought about him. She was still going to be with him regardless. It's the cops. But when family and police threaten to break them up, Khadidra is forced out of her fantasy world into a brutal reality. She was stabbed probably about 40 to 50 times all over her body. She went along with it because that was her man. And later, in Grand Prairie, Texas, 26-year-old single mother Desiree Satterwhite falls for a man who's long in the tooth with a rap sheet to match. Charles convinced her that together they could conquer the world. But when times get tough... I can't keep living like this. Charles recruits Desiree as his partner in crime. Well, they were focusing on convenience stores. Uh, places that they could run in and run out very quickly. She wanted to please them, even if it meant putting her life and the life of others in danger. All of the day. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. In Marietta, Georgia, life for Khadidra Cook takes a turn for the better. When, at the age of four, she and her sister move in with their dad after their parents divorce in the wake of a rocky relationship. Very close to our dad because um, pretty much he was there for us. He, he done everything with us. He made sure we went to school every day and made sure we kept our grades up. At a very young age, the only stability that Khadidra had was provided for her by a man. But their sweet life with the perfect parent comes to a tragic end four years later, when an aneurysm takes the life of Khadidra's father. It happened very suddenly. It was not something they were prepared for. It's a stunning blow to the two young girls. Now, with their father gone and their mother long out of the picture, Khadidra and Jessica are practically orphans. At the ages of 8 and 11, they move in with an aunt on their father's side in Cedartown, some 40 miles away. Moving with our aunt was going to be, you know, hard because we, we barely know her, so we just felt like we was going to go live with a stranger, pretty much. A stranger who can now collect their father's Social Security benefit checks until Khadidra and Jessica are of legal age. Their father was very caring, very loving. The aunt was a little different, so she knew that she could um, get that Social Security check and provide some stability for them. So the stability was really strict rules and not allowing them to do really much of anything. Khadidra goes from being the center of attention uh, from her father to now being in a crowded home, taking up space, and she's there just for a check. So not only does this become a hardship for her, but it also keeps her from getting over the absence of her father. No longer a recipient of the love and attention she was raised with, by the age of 17, Khadidra grows into a troubled young lady. She kind of lost her drive, her focus. She started smoking cigarettes and drinking, not really being a participant in much of anything. 
uh, kind of just kind of rebelling against everything. As Khadidra's 18th birthday nears, a light at the end of the tunnel presents itself when her older sister, Jessica, now a single mother of twins, asks her to move in with her. I was like, I don't really care too much what you do as long as you don't get in trouble and you stay in school. And she agreed with it. She said, OK. And so I ended up getting us a two-bedroom. It was me, her, and my daughters. No longer a minor under her aunt's guardianship, Khadidra is able to stay in high school thanks to the $846 a month she now receives from her father's Social Security death benefits. Everything was good at first, and then all of a sudden, here comes Eddie. Fifteen-year-old Eddie Lee Clark is a boy with a reputation that exceeds his years. He was someone that the neighborhood knew who he was, uh, the girls knew who he was, the adults knew who he was, and the police knew who he was. He had been in trouble numerous times as a juvenile. Uh, of course, those records are sealed in Georgia as a juvenile, but basic thefts, uh, robberies, those sort of things was what he was suspected in. I'm not sure how they met. I don't know if it's just from the streets, from family members. Eddie's rumored to roll with a local street gang. Rumor has it that he was exposed to and saw at a very young age. A lot of illicit activities in and around the home where he lived. <laughs> he didn't do, like, kid stuff. Like, he wasn't even, I don't even remember ever seeing him going to school, so I just thought he was older. He would drink, smoke. The relationship developed pretty quickly. I think at uh, probably at first glance, once once they realized they liked each other, they probably became quickly committed to one another. Why is she always tripping? Eddie catches Khadidra's eye because they like to do some of the same things. Just like him, she likes to drink, smoke, hang out. And in many ways, this is the first time that she's had the approval of a man since the death of her father. Although he lives with his mother only one block away, Eddie spends most of his time in the home Khadidra shares with Jessica. It didn't really seem like uh, Eddie mother was concerned about what he did because she ended up kicking him out. I don't know what was the reason why. So my sister ended up letting him stay with us and I told her, no, you know, that's not a good idea. Don't you have somewhere else to be? Jessica! But Eddie stays anyway. Although Khadidra's only known Eddie a few weeks, Having him around causes everything else in her life to fall by the wayside. Even school, which Khadidra drops out only four months shy of graduation. Neither of them had a job. Eddie was too young, uh, and Khadidra pretty much subsisted on the money from her father's death. This was the first time a boy really bonded with her to, to the extent that she lost sight of self, ignored school, ignored family, ignored everything. The days pass uneventfully for the couple until Eddie goes too long without checking in with his probation officer and the police come looking for him. He had violated probation, but I believe his mother said, yeah, this is where I last saw him and pointed toward Khadija's house. Okay, well, he's actually in violation of his probation. But Eddie isn't at Khadija's house, and neither is Khadija. For Khadija, playing hide and seek from the cops with Eddie may seem like fun and games but it will lead her down a dangerous path with deadly results. She didn't die initially, so he just kept stabbing her over and over again. Khadija was a participant in whatever Eddie wanted, and she went along with a smile on her face. In Cedartown, Georgia, 18-year-old Khadija Cook is hiding out with her 15-year-old boyfriend, Eddie Clark, wanted for violating his probation. Eddie had a, a juvenile record. I think his mom reported him running away from home. With eyes and ears on the street, Eddie gets word that the police are looking for him. Do you see him? Khadija and Eddie kind of went on the lam for a few days. They were staying in an abandoned home in the same area where they could see the activities, the comings and goings. The young lovers return to the apartment Khadija shares with her sister once they think the coast is clear which that wasn't the case, and police came and picked him up. It's the cops. And sent my sister to jail. Khadija's done nothing wrong, but she's already lost one man in her life, and she's not going to lose another, so she's going to go along with whatever he says. The next morning, she is released, under the provision that she can no longer have any unrelated minors in her home. It wasn't anything she was prosecuted on. It was simply, hey, don't do this again. You're harboring this guy. We're going, we could lock you up. 
life returns to normal for the Cook sisters for about a week. Until Eddie is released from juvenile detention sporting an ankle monitor. She still hung with Eddie, and that's when I just call it quits. So I was just like, I can't do it because I'm not going to go to jail behind him or I'm not getting my kids taken away. The police said he is not allowed to be here. With Eddie, Khadija sees the us versus them mentality by being with him. So when Jessica gives her this ultimatum, it goes exactly the way that one would expect. You're going to regret this. Four months after moving in with her sister, Khadija uses her monthly death benefit payment to move into her own place and quickly blows through the money. She gets her check, which is $846. Rent is actually $300. And she also had to pay for utilities. She had to pay to cut on water and gas for the first time. Within four days, all $846 of it is gone. Khadija's playing house, but the reality is that she's never been on her own. She's never had a job. She doesn't even know how to handle money. She's just going through the paces. Eddie's only 15, so really these are just youngsters playing the role of adults, and they're really not prepared for what it means to be an adult, to be on your own. This is the last of it. To make matters worse, Eddie has secretly moved in and has also cut off his ankle monitor, alerting the authorities who are now looking for him. He knew he, he did not want to go back to court. He did not want to go back to jail. And Eddie sort of had an attitude that Eddie did what Eddie wanted to. Between the pressure from her family and law enforcement's attempt to keep a constant eye on him, Eddie suggests they go to Mississippi, where he claims to have extended family. 15-year-old's thought process is thinking that, OK, I can go to Mississippi, live with my family, and the police won't bother me there. And Khadija was all for it. They could live happily ever after. Khadija's mind is wrapped up into this romantic ideal as to what a relationship should be. So when Eddie gives her a plan as to how the two of them can run away, she embraces it. In many ways, subconsciously, it reminds her of her father taking control, so she goes with it. But with nothing left from the monthly benefit check, the two can't leave town which makes it even more unusual when Eddie tells Khadija to order some pizza. We don't have any money, Eddie. She said she didn't understand why, because they didn't have no money. Khadija believed that he had gone home to his mother's home to get some money from his mother. But Eddie has something else in mind. Half an hour after Khadija calls in the order, 27-year-old Elizabeth Hutchison arrives with the pizza. The driver was engaged to be married. She had a four-year-old child. She had taken this job just simply as a way to make a little extra money. She got the money in the Khadija's in the kitchen. First thing she really heard was the doorbell, and then Eddie answering the door and stating to the piece of delivery person, she's in the back. Where'd you say she was? And all of a sudden, Khadija hears a scream. Khadija rushes towards the sound, and what happens next shocks her to her core. She sees Mr. Clark stabbing and hitting the pizza delivery driver. He used two different knives. One knife was a pocket knife that he always carried around, and then the other knife was a kitchen knife that he probably just saw sitting around and just picked up. <laughs> and he proceeded to keep stabbing and stabbing and stabbing. We got to go. She's... Eddie started to leave. She was in a complete state of shock. Her ability to really understand what's going on is pretty much gone at that point. She's sort of in a fight, flight, or freeze mode. The two disappear into the night. They got away with less than $30. Moments after Khadija and Eddie flee, a Cedartown police officer arrives on the scene after hearing her agonizing screams during a routine traffic stop up the street. I just heard some suspicious activity. So the police show up and, and see Elizabeth there being a plume of blood. And they talk to her. I think she's saying something. She gives a description of both Khadija and Eddie. She's gone. It is the last thing Elizabeth Hutchison will ever say. She expired there at the house. 
And now Khadidra and Eddie are on the run for a lot more than a parole violation. They're wanted for murder. The night of the murder, I got a call from the friend that I was staying with. She ended up calling me, and she said, police are down here at your sister's house. They're saying that she killed someone. My heart dropped, and I just dropped to my knees when I just cried because I said, this can't be happening. And later, in Grand Prairie, Texas, 26-year-old Desiree Satterwhite falls for the charms of an older man with a violent past. He had a significant number of reward theft, firearms, violations, burglary, and aggravated robbery. And when he returns to his criminal ways, Desiree is more than eager to go along with him. Charles introduced Desiree to what he used to do and talked about how they could do it together. In Cedartown, Georgia, teen couple Khadidra Cook and Eddie Clark are on the lam after police linked them to the murder of a pizza delivery woman. And it was pretty easy to connect them. Khadija called from her house. The lease was in her name. And everyone there in the, in the town knew that Eddie and Khadija were always together. Everybody started calling me. They was like, do you know where your sister is? I'm like, no. Like, I'm looking for her. Like, I just found out. Like, what's going on? It really just hurt. Khadija and Eddie frantically call friends, looking for a place to hide out. But no one wants to get involved. Come on, man, I need your help. What? Most of their friends had their own stuff going on. It may be legal or illegal, and didn't want the police finding out what they were doing. With nowhere to go, Khadija and Eddie spend the night in yet another abandoned house, and then are spotted the next morning a mile from the crime scene. As word of their capture gets out, family and friends are in shock. Hey, come on. I wanted to think the best, you know, well, maybe, you know, she wasn't there. But I was like, no, then if she wasn't there, then how she end up with Eddie and why are they running? Once in custody, Khadija and Eddie are separated and Khadija pleads ignorance. Khadija says, Dad, I didn't know what was going on. I just made the phone call to the pizza place. That's all that I really know. She was acting pretty confused, hoping that um, everything would go away and there would be no other questions asked, but that wasn't the case. She had no idea what they'd done. She had no idea the severity of it. She was inquiring with me about the possibility of a bond. And my comment to her was that in fact, Georgia still had a death penalty and this could in fact be a death penalty case. She should be concerned with what sort of sentence she could be facing. Khadija is in denial. Yes, of course, she called for the pizza delivery, but she didn't rob the person herself. In her mind, she's not guilty of any kind of crime. Less than 48 hours after the murder of Elizabeth Hutchison, Khadija and Eddie are both charged with aggravated assault, aggravated robbery, and murder. She ended up pleading to felony murder. She received life. When I went to go visit her in jail, she just kept saying, like, how could I be so stupid? Everybody tried to tell me, look what type of situation I'm in. Although Eddie is a minor, the severity of the crime enables him to be tried as an adult, but without the possibility of a death sentence. Eddie also strikes a deal and pleads guilty. At the age of 17, he is sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 50 years. The once enamored couple never communicates again. That love that she had for Eddie was lost very quickly, soon as the reality set in that she was going to rot in jail. I believe if Eddie Clark hadn't been in her life, I don't believe she'd be sitting in prison. I think Khadija Cook was simple with, with the ways of the world. And I, I think she had some growing up to do. And unfortunately, it happened way too fast, and now she's going to have to grow up in prison. Khadija is a very young woman, but she spent more time in jail than she actually spent in the relationship with Eddie. So one could imagine that the only thing she's concerned about right now is to how she's going to get through this prison sentence, how she's going to stay safe, how is she going to live her life? I wish she had never met him. Her life would have turned out totally different. Khadija Cook sacrificed the unrestricted freedom of adulthood for the love of a teenage boy. In Grand Prairie, Texas, Desiree Satterwhite will turn her back on the people who love her for the chance at happiness with an older man. 
Desiree grows up in Grand Prairie, Texas, in the perfect home life, with the kind of parents every kid sees on TV and wishes they had in real life. Whether it was navigating through school, life, teen years, or whatever, she had her parents there for her, giving her support. Her parents were attentive. Her parents cared about her. Her parents loved her. Even after, at the age of 14, Desiree gives birth to her first child, and she doesn't know who the father is. She began associating with young men that uh, perhaps weren't doing what they should have done, and she liked the bad boys. She liked the excitement of it. Sometimes, you know, influences get the best of people. No matter how hard parents try, children can go the wrong way, make mistakes. That's what childhood is for. With her parents willing to take on some of the responsibilities that come with being a teen mom, Desiree graduates high school, but bounces from one dead-end job to the next. At the age of 23, after another failed relationship, she gives birth to her second child. She was pregnant again, and once again, she was left without a father for her children. And frustrating for her, but luckily for her, she had her parents to help her. Too much support and too much permissiveness might have the opposite intent. And for someone like Desiree, instead of using it as a springboard towards success and achievement, instead it pushed her more towards complacency. For a single mother with two children to support, a life means a job. That's when a family member mentions an opening for a receptionist at the local welfare office. It was her mom who introduced her to the possibility of working at the welfare office. And it was a job that her parents could be proud of. Desiree takes to her job immediately and becomes a welcoming sight to those in need. Hi, how are you? Seeing her smiling could make all the difference in the world for them. And I think she realized that. But after a few months on the job, Desiree's smile hides her feelings of boredom until the day her routine is broken up by the arrival of 48-year-old Charles Camp, a man down on his luck. He was handsome, charismatic. Man, these are those beautiful eyes you smell nice, too. Charming, confident. He's just having a bump in the road right now. Desiree is intrigued by the much older, smooth-talking Romeo, whose surface appeal hides a violent and criminal past. He had a significant number of arrests and convictions for theft, firearms, violations, burglary, aggravated burglary, and aggravated robbery. Miss Desiree? Yes. And after his most recent prison stint, the Kansas native has relocated to Grand Prairie in search of a fresh start. He was living with his sister. He had family here. So if he was seeking to leave the Kansas area, this would be a natural place to go. But once he meets Desiree, instead of a fresh start, he'll find a partner in crime. She was pumping him up as her Clyde, and he was pumping her up as his Bonnie. In Grand Prairie, Texas, 26-year-old Desiree Satterwhite is drawn to handsome stranger, 48-year-old Charles Camp, a man who, unbeknownst to her, has a violent criminal past. Charles was a career criminal. He committed a string of crimes. He had been in and out of jail all his life. Desiree came from a very good home. She had a very loving father. So to meet someone like Charles, who's an older man, uh, she sees the best in him right away. She becomes like putty in his hands. Uh, Miss Desiree. Yes. Several visits later, Charles starts looking forward to more than just his welfare checks. Charles knew what he wanted, and he saw it in Desiree. And so he started courting her at work. And he was persistent, and that was flattering to her. What are you doing here? Just a few weeks in, the two begin a passionate affair, spending almost all of their time together at his sister's house where he's staying. After seeing Charles for almost a week, Desiree brings him home to meet her parents. The meeting doesn't go as well as she hopes. 
how did you two meet? And her mom, dad didn't understand and did not welcome Charles's intrusion in her life. 48. <laughs> 48. Was enough to give him pause and threw up a bunch of red flags for him. Desiree's parents really don't like Charles. They see him as a predator. After all, he comes from their generation. He's got a lot more experience than she does. And they know that she's really naive to the ways of the world. Over the next month, Desiree spends more and more time with Charles and less and less time at home. She still had contact with her children, but they primarily lived with their grandparents during that period, but mostly she stayed with Charles and she avoided her parents. It had to be disheartening for Desiree's mom and dad because here she was so easily swayed and just running off and literally forgetting her children. Desiree had children when she was very young. In fact, when she was just a child herself, Desiree never had that freedom that comes with being a youngster, being a teenager. Now she has that with Charles. But she did have parents who tried to keep her on the right path, the path of responsibility. All seems well for the couple until cutbacks at the welfare office forced Desiree out of work. We're having cutbacks and we have to let you go, I'm sorry. All of a sudden she lost her job. They no longer needed her services. You have to let me go. And here she looks at Charles, what are we going to do? I lost my job. Well, we don't Desiree's uncertainty is compounded by the fact that Charles has not been able to find employment because of his criminal record. Charles, like so many others who are released from prison, oftentimes find themselves, you know, they're going out searching for jobs. And on the application, it asks that question, and that question is one that a lot of employees shy away from, and they will turn you away. And he was turned away. When Desiree's parents learn of their daughter's plight, they try to intervene. They're telling her, come home, get your life together. We'll help you. And that's not what Desiree wanted. Desiree, if it were a choice between choosing between Charles and the comfort of her parents' home, she would rather be with Charles. Madly in love and not wanting to be a burden on either of their families any longer, the two take up residence in Desiree's car until they can figure something out. Living in a car, very uncomfortable. And it starts not only the wear on them individually, but wear on them as a couple. Two nights later, Charles tells Desiree he thinks he has a solution. Get some cash, okay? They've got to eat. They got to figure out a way to make some money. And it had to be pretty quick. He revealed information about the robberies, his past. I doubt that he told her about how lengthy his history was. I don't think he was ever truly honest with her. Charles portrays himself to Desiree as a total victim of injustice, of society. Sort of like a Robin Hood type who robs from the rich and gives to the poor, but all in all, doesn't really want to be involved in illegal activities, but has no choice. He's got to survive. And Desiree loves this man, is enthralled by him, and trusts him. Charles tells Desiree how he went about robbing small businesses and how it'd be a lot less dangerous to pull one off now if he had someone to scout the place out prior to him going in. Me? You want me to help you? He's pulling on her hard to get her to say, OK, I'm going to come in with you. And so perhaps she's willing to do what she has to do in order for him to successfully get through a robbery. With Desiree on board, there's only one more thing Charles needs, a gun. And she tells him she knows where they can get one. Desiree started injecting her thoughts and her ideas on how they could make this uh, life of crime work, if you will. The next day, Desiree and Charles make a surprise visit to her parents' house. So she knew her mother had a gun, and she volunteered her mom's gun to be used as they committed their crimes. 
Desiree had only brought Charles to her parents' house three times. The last time she brought him over there, he stole the gun. Desiree and Charles think they found the solution to their problems, but they'll soon find out. It's kind of slow today. If you play with fire, you're going to get burned. She had family and children and everything in the world to live for. And she disregarded that for, you know, easy money. She put everything on the line for him. Twenty-six-year-old Desiree Satterwhite and her boyfriend, 48-year-old ex-convict Charles Camp, are homeless, jobless, and living in their car in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That's when her man tells her he knows how to get some quick cash by hitting small shops. I absolutely think that there was an attraction to that lifestyle. I think she perceived it as being romantic. She perceived it as being exciting. I think Desiree, in her heart of hearts, was a risk taker. And I think she had a good time with this. And I think that she perceived Charles as being powerful. Later that afternoon, the duo makes their debut score. The first location that they went to, uh, that we have evidence of, was a sandwich shop uh, in the city of Fort Worth on Maurice Avenue. Uh, it was located in a strip mall. Desiree goes in and stakes the place out. It's kind of slow today. Isn't it? Talk to the clerk, maybe look around, come back out, tell them how many people were inside. She's seen that no one's here, there are no customers. And so, you know, he goes into the store and while he doesn't fire the firearm, he does brandish it and demand all the money. For 20 minutes till I'm long gone. The clerk hands over the cash and the robbery goes off without a hitch. Desiree and Charles flee with their take, a little over $100. It's barely enough to get them a hotel room for the night. They weren't living high on the hog at all. They had enough money at the end of the day to get a room and some food and gas. You would think that maybe they went out and partied and had a good time. And actually, they took care of business. They wanted to eat. And they paid the car insurance. It was their home. They needed to have it secured. But that money was gone. It wasn't much, so it was gone quickly. And they needed to come up with more. And there, you start hatching the plans for more robberies, more victims. A fantasy the two turn into a reality in and around the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area several more times. Desiree had an opportunity to make the right decision. She could have gone home to her parents and to her children in a normal life. But instead, she decided to stay there and abet that particular situation. Most likely because it was for her love for Charles, and just as important, the fact that this was so exciting. It brought a new meaning to her life. As usual, their spoils are only enough for essentials and an occasional hotel room. And this, this is the big payoff. This is a reward for uh, all the work that they've done, all, all, all the, the crimes that they've committed thus far, just to, just to be able to sleep in a bed. Over the next six days, Charles and Desiree keep their heists going. They were spacing them out geographically as they committed more offenses. I'm not positive even that we know all of the offenses they committed. I think Desiree and Charles believed as long as they kept going to different jurisdictions and doing robberies in different cities that they could keep hopscotching their way across Texas and that way they could roam around. And the more places they rob, the more it becomes equal part necessity and equal part thrill. You got the idea that they felt invincible and that they were feeding off of one another's energy. Desiree saw this man as her knight in shining armor and she was his ride or die chick. Desiree and Charles are caught up in their own world, in their own fantasy, in their own reality. For them, it's day to day, robbery by robbery. Then 11 days into their spree, Desiree and Charles are so desperate for cash, they return to the scene of their first crime to rob another store a few doors down. And that turned out to be a mistake for them. 
it put them in a location where people could compare notes and identify them. In addition, the new location is also a lot more high tech than the first one. That store had a beautiful video surveillance system. So when they left the store, we had wonderful video footage of their faces and Desiree's car. Desiree and Charles don't know it, but their images have made their way across all the local jurisdictions, and a manhunt ensues. The police uh, were working together once they determined that there was a, a pattern here. And when Desiree and Charles try their luck in Dallas, their luck will finally run out. When they were stopped by the police, the firearm that was used to commit the offenses was in the car. She and Charles were in this together. They quickly reached a point of no return. In Grand Prairie, Texas, Desiree Satterwhite has been enlisted into a life of crime by her ex-con boyfriend, Charles Kent. The two are suspected of the armed robberies of eight businesses in just 11 days. And police from four jurisdictions are hot on their heels. You got the idea that they felt invincible and that they were feeding off of one another's energy. She was supporting him and lifting him up. A be on the lookout is issued, featuring pictures and detailed descriptions of Charles, Desiree, and Desiree's car. Desiree and Charles were oblivious to the fact that police were putting the pieces together and they were ready to pounce, really, at that point. It was only a matter of time. So far, they've been able to skirt the law, but one crisp morning 18 miles down the road in Dallas, their luck runs out. The police officer observed them scoping out businesses in Dallas and saw the vehicle and saw the individuals in the vehicle and realized they were identical to the description that had been given. As officers move in, Desiree and Charles's gun is in plain sight. It was right there in the car and was within arm's reach of both defendants when they were stopped. Uh, it is very lucky for those police officers that they didn't decide to run or to shoot. Desiree and Charles are arrested without incident and taken into custody. Under the interrogation spotlight, Desiree covers her own skin. Initially, she denied responsibility. Then she minimized the situation significantly. For example, she told the police that she'd only known Charles for two to three weeks, when in fact she'd known him for longer than that. When investigators tell her she's facing felony charges, Desiree's flabbergasted. She hasn't done anything illegal as far as she's concerned. She's uh, just kind of been a passenger along on a joyride. Because she was thinking she did not have any firearms, she did not threaten anyone. All she did was go in and case the place and drive away. This is what Desiree may have been thinking all along. I'm not the one with the gun. I'm not the one demanding the money. I'm not the one committing the crime. But the fact of the matter is, she was involved in a crime. Eventually, she started conceding that she had done things that made her a party to the offense, but she attempted to suggest that she didn't know what was going on. When that didn't work, then she tried to suggest that Charles had coerced her or forced her in some fashion. After a period of time, she did concede that she had assisted in the commission of the robberies, and she described her own conduct. But Charles is not as uncaring toward his love of one month. Knowing Desiree has her whole life ahead of her, and children to take care of. He falls on his sword for her and tries to absolve her of any involvement. Charles painted a picture of Desiree as not being culpable. He made her seem like she was innocent and it was all him. Charles constantly tried to convince us that she was not involved and that she had no responsibility for it. But despite Charles's best efforts, prosecutors charged Desiree with the same charge as him. Three counts of aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon.
Desiree was very much an active part in the commission of this crime. The car was hers, and all the evidence points to the fact that she was the one driving. Then she would go in and make sure that the times were ripe for an aggravated robbery. Like it's showtime. Prosecutors offer Desiree a deal, a 16-year sentence if she pleads guilty. She rejects it. I think that she thought, because of her lack of criminal history, uh, and that she was young and pretty and not very threatening appearing, I think she thought that she could kind of get away with it. Her parents are crushed. They want Desiree to accept this deal. They want Desiree to be part of their lives and to have a normal life. But once again, she turns her back on them. Desiree goes on trial a few months later. After an eight-day trial, the jury takes less than 20 minutes to find Desiree guilty on three counts of aggravated armed robbery. She is sentenced to 40 years in prison. Charles, on the other hand, his long record played against him in a big way. He was sentenced to life in prison. He's never going to be outside of a prison wall uh, during his life. Charles' past came back to haunt him and now he's paying the price. Desiree may not have had a past like Charles, but now she's paying the price by not having a future. Desiree has a lot of lessons to learn, but they're not going to come immediately for her. She's missing a lot of time in her children's lives and her parents, you know, 40 years, her parents could be gone by the time she gets out and then her and Charles will never be together again. Desiree had parents who cared about her. She had a good support system. Didn't have to be this way for her. Không, không sớm một rồi hay vần nữa nhá Tôi không sớm một rồi hay vần nhá Hello Cô Hoa đang này Làm gì vậy À Thế Tại vì thịnh tối nay nó đi thi cô Thèo không đi được Xong bảo sớm Thế để tối mai nhá À từ 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 xem ạ Tối mai thịnh nó cũng đi thi cô Tưởng anh Tiến Tưởng anh Tiến đi công tác rồi mà có gì nữa chị hỏi anh Thịnh xong rồi chị bảo nhé Ok
Hi. Không. Chịu, chịu, chịu Ê, cay quá Tôi mượn trao, ai có trao nhỉ? Thank you. Ai một người cuối bảng, một người đầu bảng bên kia cũng thế, ngược lại à. Wow, wow, wow. À, nó hack, nó hack, nó hack đây, nó bắn toàn đầu. Vlog vậy
Hi. Gracias. 